Jim Turk is the uh, uh, executive director of the Gay and the uh, Association of University Teachers, CAUT. Um, we were prompted to ask him to come and talk to us because of the release of a report in November last, and the report said uh, entitled "Open for Business uh, on on what terms." I I saw a reference to it, read the report, and and on the strength of that, really thought it'd be great if Jim could come and talk to us about that. His 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 title of his talk today is "Protecting Academic Integrity." when universities collaborate with industry. So Jim, uh, tell me a little bit about the background to uh, the report, the investigation itself, and then perhaps a little bit about what the report says. The background is actually a concern about what sociologists call the corporatization of the university, which mm. <laughs> you've written about, others of us have written about it, yes, and for many years has been a concern. Yes. Um, in 2010, I read a wonderful report uh, done by the Center for American Progress in the United States, looking at the collaborative agreements between major American universities and petroleum companies. Uh -huh. um, and there were 10 of them, 10 collaborations they'd looked at. The total value of them was almost a billion dollars. Uh, one between the University of California, Berkeley, and British Petroleum was for half a billion dollars alone. Mm -hmm. And these were research collaborations. And what this study had done was to look at had the university protected in those agreements the right to publish, the academic freedom of the faculty, and so forth, and found that in almost none of them had those things been protected. So we thought it would be interesting to do a similar study in Canada. Um, and we began identifying the, the research collaborations. We're, we're talking about actual collaboration. We're not talking about when a university receives money to name a building or anything else. So we're talking about ongoing joint projects, either in research collaborations or in running programs. Um, and it took us, I had three staff working on it for the better part of two years just to get the documents because they were all secret virtually. Um, nobody in the university community was allowed to see them, nor the public, and so we had to go to extraordinary lengths under access to information yeah. to get the documents so we could actually assess them. And uh, what we found was that the majority of them, the universities had uh, quite uh, explicitly abandoned their academic integrity. There was little protection for academic freedom, for the right to publish. Uh, they often allowed uh, the collaborator, collaborating partner to have a say over academic matters. Uh, there were a few that didn't. Um, and so, uh, you know, we just wanted to look at, at those findings. We were hoping that we'd find, we d wouldn't find what we did find. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we want to talk about, well, what can be done to help ensure that doesn't happen in the future. Um, As I recall, I mean, the report, there's, uh, there are 12 uh, collaborations right. that you focus on, and seven are research and that's right. five are teaching. That's right. Maybe, let me ask you to highlight perhaps one of each. To, to illustrate, um, and, and of course one of each that don't live up to our expectations sure. well, would be useful. One of the research collaborations ha is the Center for Oil Sands Innovation, which is a partnership between the University of Alberta and Imperial Oil, mm -hmm. uh, a collaboration in, into research on the oil sands and related issues. Um, it's my favorite acronym, COSI. <laughs> uh, and in that, uh, uh, Imperial Oil has a say over some academic matters. There's no guarantees for academic freedom. There are almost no protections. There can be limits on the right to publish uh, in that agreement. Um, and then in terms of program collaborations, there well, one is between the University of Western Ontario and a major uh, Canadian law firm which wanted to set up a program, and Western agreed to it, in mining law. Mm -hmm. But it gives the law firm uh, some say over who gets to teach and over the curriculum, mm -hmm. which uh, in our view is entirely inappropriate. Indeed. Now the report ends with um, suggestions yes. about the, s the sort of principles that uh, universities in these collaborations might adopt. Can you say something about those? Yes. Well, we think it's it's really important for the university community to be aware of proposed collaborations before they're finalized, so mm -hmm. that uh, there should be a transparency that was absent in virtually all these cases. Yes. Um, and that 
the um, so that's that's the first thing that's required. So what we're suggesting is that uh, faculty and students may initially make requests to know what collaborations exist on their campus mm -hmm. and then ask to see the agreements and then do the kind of analysis of those that we've found and to try to get the university to adopt a policy that any proposed collaborations would have to uh, be dealt with through the collegial decision-making bodies within the institution right. and involve all the faculty in whatever department faculty or center where the collaboration would take place and uh, further to identify certain principles, so we've suggested some of those in terms of protection of academic freedom, right to publish, uh, academic, uh, the university having control over ac all academic decisions in relation to the program, a set of guiding principles that should be Im embedded in university policy and in collective agreements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's, 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 it's fascinating. It is. And, uh, and in, well, in a, in a time when universities are so desperate for money, Yes and have, I think a lot of these agreements came about because their fundraising department, I think most places, they call, I don't know what they call it, UBC now, in most universities they call it advancement. I mean, it was fundraising, then it was development, and now it's advancement. Yes. Um, have people who aren't academics who specialize in doing that, and so put together packages, and they aren't sensitive to the fact that this isn't just another corporation or another charity, mm -hmm. that there are certain principles that have to be protected in these arrangements, and uh, they don't do that, they're signed, they go into place, and then only after the fact can we try to repair them, and there have been three or four uh, where we've intervened and actually gotten them changed okay. to get rid of, and, and uh, one of them in the in the book is, is one of those at yes. uh, Western Ontario, I mean, sorry, at Wilfrid Laurier in Waterloo. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The, the other side of that, too, as we know, uh, the, the corporatization part that we talked about earlier, you mentioned earlier. Is, is the rise of the what we'll call the academic industry That's offices. Right. That's right. Uh, which almost all, well, all the research universities, as we know, research intensives, have such an office whose objective is to promote industry. Well, we have, no, we have no objection to collaborations. They can be very useful for both parties. Indeed. But if Imperial Oil wants to do research in the oil sands, it can hire scientists and do that. Yes. If it wants to do it in partnership with the University of Alberta, it wants the, that partnership for a reason, and presumably it wants the credibility and so on of being a, a, an associated uh, partnership, a collaboration. There's a price to be paid for that. And if, you, if universities aren't prepared to insist on their own integrity, over time they'll lose the very reason the industry wants to be a partner with them. Indeed, indeed. <laughs>